Hello and welcome to GameStack. Once again, we're talking about games that did not have a home console release, but they were in the arcades. Yeah, and another great batch. It's I think we could do tons of these. There's so many arcade games out there that uh, would fit this mold. Yeah, and hell, let's just get right on into it. What I, do you think? I agree. All right. Dynagear is a side-scrolling run-and-gun game by Sammy. In the year 2993, two battling spaceships fall through a time hole that sends them back 65 million years in the past. The evil Gustav quickly turns the dinosaurs of the planet against you. There's also a wolf-like clan that gets involved and wants to get Gustav off the planet so it can return to normal. As you start the game, you choose from two characters. Roger, who was battling Gustav in space, or a wolf from the planet where the two ships crashed. Both of these characters control fairly similar with slight differences in their speed and jumping attributes. Honestly, you won't really notice a big difference between the two characters. As you'd expect, every level is filled with these dinosaurs who have been turned evil. Man, Gustav must have talked some serious trash about you to get these dinosaurs all riled up. I guess I'll overlook the fact that they have so many different dinosaurs from different eras at once. I'm sorry, but the Stegosaurus was not around at the same time as the Tyrannosaurus Rex. And neither of those were around in the same era as the fire-breathing pterodactyl or the floating, enlarging Cytania. Duh! I mean, anybody knows that. You learned that in first grade. Anyways, as you fight your way through each level, you'll come across many treasure chests. These mainly hold different weapons. Most of the weapons you find are effective, but I found the ball and chain to be the most fun to wield. It's fun getting that thing going top speed and just pummeling enemies. Most of them are just pushovers and will die pretty quickly. The problem is that they simply disappear and have no chance to become fossil fuels for my car in the future. The bosses, on the other hand, are not so easy, and that's probably why they're bosses. It's really hard to get your timing down while fighting a boss. When your weapon goes on auto and you can't really control it very well, that's when a boss seems to get you. It's really hard to keep from button mashing, but you've got to slow down a tad and learn the pattern for each boss. But that doesn't mean you'll be safe. I died many times fighting these bosses, but it didn't matter as I had another continue ready to go if I needed it. After fighting a boss, you'll be able to collect coins that are way too big for anybody's pocket. I honestly don't know where the dinosaurs were holding coins of this size. And did dinosaurs actually have currency? At first glance, I thought they were coins of the Mortal Kombat logo. But there's no shops to spend these in, you just collect coins for points. And of course, points are only important if you're going for a high score. The game flows fairly smooth, and you do have a double jump feature which can help in sticky situations or if you have a chance to get up higher. You can also climb walls and fight while you're on the wall. I like this feature. Be on the lookout for places to climb as several levels will have branching paths you can take. I also like the graphics in this game. The backgrounds are quite detailed as are the sprites. I like how when you kill some dinosaurs in the first level they turn into skeletons. All the dinosaurs really do look pissed off so you won't feel bad about killing them. Playing this game I don't feel too sad that it didn't make it home from the arcade. But it still was a fun experience. What would you guys think? Would you like this on a home console? This one's called JJ Squawkers, and it's from a company called Athena. The game starts out with some vandals throwing rocks and things at your house while you're sleeping. Well, you're not happy about this at all, so you're on a mission to destroy pretty much everything you see. You're a bird whose name is, of course, JJ Squawkers. Actually, it's Annie, but I call him JJ. You throw tomatoes and other types of shots to take out your enemies. You can shoot up and down as well as left and right, kind of like ghouls and ghosts if it was on crack. You can also jump, of course, and the game has a very quick pace to it. Actually, the entire game is off the wall crazy. I mean, just look at some of these backgrounds. They're completely nonsensical. Some of your weapons are pretty crazy as well, like this slinky type thing with shoes on it that walks across horizontal surfaces. This is actually my favorite weapon to use. You can also power up each weapon if a certain item is dropped, which it rarely ever is. You can take multiple hits per life thanks to your life bar, which is something that's pretty rare to see in an arcade game. When you actually do die, you sound like a cat being crushed with an Xbox. Maybe the developers didn't know that birds and cats make different sounds? I don't know. Anyway, when you do die, the game sets you back to a checkpoint which usually isn't tremendously far away. That is, unless you're fighting a boss, then it resurrects you right there. Well, unless you need to continue, then it'll set you back before the boss fight. Unless you're playing two players, then one of you respawns right there just as long as the other is still alive. That is unless, wait, I think that covers it. 
The game itself can be pretty tough since there is so much crazy crap all over the screen at pretty much any given time. There's a bit of slowdown here and there, but it's not too bad. Overall, the game is fairly short, and despite its difficulty, you can probably plow through it pretty quick. I feel sad for JJ Squawkers having to live in this messed up LSD world. The graphics are extremely colorful, maybe too colorful. I mean, if you look at this game for too long, you might even get a headache. What's weird is that the first level is so normal looking. Maybe as you progress through the game, you're seeing what JJ is seeing as his sanity begins to slip away. I do like the day to night to day transitions in the first stage though, that's pretty cool. The sound in the music is... it's okay. The music is just kind of there and sometimes it's almost annoying. However, some of the sound effects are cartoony and that makes them cool. So why the hell didn't this game grace home consoles? Well, for one, it likely was not very popular. I mean, have you ever even heard of this one? I hadn't until someone recommended that we include it. And even if it was in every arcade in the world, I doubt too many quarters would have been dropped into it. Still, it's a fun game and it does have some unique charm. Trio the Punch Never Forget Me is an odd beat em up by Data East. Trust me, Trio the Punch, I will never forget you. How could I? Anyway, I can't really decide where I want to start with this game as it's so bizarre, but I guess you have to start somewhere, so here we go. You begin by picking one of three characters, and each one is awesome in their own way. The ninja is cool because he can throw stars that can hit at a good range. He also turns into a piece of wood when he gets hit by enemies. You can't do anything while you're a piece of wood. It's so weird, but I like it. Then there's the swordsman. His picture looks nothing like what I thought his sprite would look like. To me, this guy looks like he's from Rastan or games like this with his sword and loincloth. He feels kind of slow, but he's really fun to play the game with. Lastly is the tough guy. This guy seems to have a claw as a weapon and he uses it for in-close fighting. His range seems limited, but he can attack upwards and that's always good. Each character has his own music that loops over and over again. It doesn't even stop between stages and keeps playing. All three tracks are really enjoyable, even though they repeat constantly and everyone's got sick of hearing them. The game itself is just strange in that levels for the most part are very short. Most of them will have an objective like collecting a certain number of hearts. Once you've satisfied this requirement, a boss will appear. Most of these bosses are no problem and you can beat them fairly quickly. There's a sheep boss towards the beginning of the game that killed me once and then cursed me. He transformed me into a sheep. I had to fight him again as a sheep and then I played the next level as a sheep. You'd think I'd be sad about this predicament, but I wasn't as the sheep is pretty damn powerful and his weapon, which are tiny sheep, bounce like a ball and can do some nice damage. Not only do you have a main attack, you also have a sub attack that can do some nice damage as well. After every stage you get a chance at the lottery wheel. Just tap a button to stop the numbers from being highlighted. You have a chance to upgrade many things like your life, sub weapon and main weapon. Lucky cha cha cha! There's also a change option that lets you switch characters. You can also land on Unlucky, which of course gives you nothing. Upgrading your weapon is nice and makes killing enemies a lot quicker. One odd play mechanic that I have to mention is the ability to bounce on top of your enemies. This doesn't damage them or you at all. Hell, you can even bounce on top of their projectile shots and still take no damage. It feels kind of strange doing this at first, but it adds a little bit of strategy to the way you fight some of the enemies in the game. The graphics aren't bad at all, but they do look like an early game with the way the animation is and everything. The game came out in 1989, but honestly the graphics look like something from a mid-1987 era game. I gotta say that I was pleasantly surprised playing this game for the first time. It's pretty addictive and you'll want to keep playing through all 35 levels just to see what other wackiness it holds. Even the continue screen is on crack when you decide to keep going. This would have made a great console game in my opinion. Typical Data East wackiness. Definitely check this one out, it's a lot of fun. Well, there we go. Um, I don't know, Joe. Playing these games on MAME is it's cool and all, but I, there, there's something missing. I don't know what it is. Something's just not feeling like the original arcade. 
Well, that's because you're playing on an emulator, my friend. Yeah, so. that's true. Maybe maybe if I got a arcade stick, USB might, arcade stick. Might help a little bit, but I don't know. Anyway, let's just get back into more games. I agree. A lot of you have requested that we check out OutZone. This one is a vertically oriented run and gun game from Toaplan. You've got two, count them, two different weapons to choose from. I don't even know if I can count that high. Anyway, you'll come across C icons and this will let you switch between your two different weapons. One is a purple shot and you can shoot in any direction. The other is a three way spread, but unfortunately your character completely forgets how to turn around when using this weapon. So basically the weapon system was designed with trade offs in mind. Personally, I like to stick with the three way shot as much as possible as I feel it helps defend me much more. You also have a limited number of bomb blasts which clear the screen. Oh, and you also have a constantly depleting energy meter. If you let this run out, then you'll slow down, stop moving, and fall over dead. Fortunately, this is extremely hard to let happen since there are so many E icons all over the place which replenish your energy. Just be sure to grab them when you can and you'll be fine. The goal of this game is really more about staying alive rather than just killing everything. I say that because it's extraordinarily easy to die. Since your character is a complete pansy, he explodes when getting hit by any single bullet. Why he doesn't invest in body armor is beyond me, especially when he's heading into such insurmountable odds all by himself. Or with a friend in two player mode! And oh man is the enemy relentless. Many of them will hide behind corners waiting to shoot you as you walk by, but you can't turn to shoot them because you're carrying the three way shot. Not like it'd matter much if you could anyway, because there's usually another enemy over somewhere else that'll take you down. In these situations, you really just need to use your bomb to clear the area. Fortunately, there's lots and lots of checkpoints. In fact, usually whenever you see a C icon, there's probably going to be a checkpoint right there. If you run out of lives and need to continue, they're going to send you a lot further back though. There's also SP icons that'll pop up once in a blue moon. These can range from a shield which lets you take an extra hit to different weapons like a flamethrower or a spinning ball thingy that's pretty cool. The boss fights can be interesting. Often you'll be tempted to use the bomb to defend yourself from the incoming bullets, but that's probably not going to harm the boss. That's because their weak point is only exposed for a second or two every once in a while. But if you use the bomb when this happens, then you're going to make short work of him, no problem. Then you just keep on walking as the entire game is just one single scrolling screen. It's awful nice of the enemy to pack everything into a convenient area that doesn't vary more than 20 feet or so in latitude. The graphics are fairly nice, though really nothing too far beyond the capabilities of the game consoles at the time. The music has some nice melodies here and there, but the sound of this particular FM synth is kind of abrasive. It's not too bad, though. I'm surprised this didn't come out for any home consoles in Japan. And if it had, it would have never been released over here because companies wanted to give us stuff like Green Dog instead. Overall, it's an interesting take on the run and gun genre that's definitely worth a play. But wait, two years later Toaplan came out with Fixate, which is a spiritual sequel. The gameplay here is the same basic concept. Two different weapons with the spread being locked forward. Instead of C icons, you now have a rainbow square. Walk across this and your weapon type switches. But you can walk across the same square again and again if you want to keep switching your weapons back and forth. This one lets you select from eight different characters, but they all play more or less the same even though their weapons are slightly different. There's now question mark icons which will give you something random like a speed boost or a special weapon. You still have your bomb blasts, but this time they only clear the path in front of you instead of the entire screen. Some parts of the game even play like a vertical shooter. These parts are really only okay. And when you die you respawn right there instead of back at a checkpoint so this game is much much easier. Despite coming out two years after OutZone, the visuals look much more grainy and far less refined I think. In fact, I'd say it looks more like an earlier rather than a later game. There seems to be a lot more slowdown as well. I wonder if they lost a lot of their good staff before they started work on this. The audio is pretty bad, but I'm going to chalk that up to bad emulation. As someone who owns some arcade PCBs, I can safely say that MAME has never really been on the forefront of accurate arcade sound emulation. Anyway, when it comes down to it, I'd probably rather play OutZone over Fixate, but you should try them both.
This is Kengo by Irem. The game starts out with you witnessing the bloody murder of some woman, most likely your significant other. Your character arrives a moment too late to save her life. From here on out, it's quite obvious that you're out to get revenge for this woman, whoever she is. The game looks like a lot of other ninja-style games out there. At first glance, it looks very similar to, say, Revenge of Shinobi, but maybe that's just me. Your character has a sword for a main weapon. You can hold down the action button for a couple of seconds, and this will give you a powerful blast from your sword. It will also defend you from weak attacks from enemies. The attack is actually very handy and does a lot of damage, so you'll be using it a lot. If you don't, then it's going to take you a hell of a long time and a lot of lives to defeat bosses. Enemies come at you constantly, and mowing them down with your sword feels good. I do miss having some throwing stars, and these would have made the game a touch more enjoyable, I think. One thing that I don't really like in this game is jumping. Instead of having a dedicated jump button like normal games, you jump by pushing up. It works fine, but damn, I'd much rather push a button to make my character jump. In each level, there are breakable items such as lanterns and boxes which will give you health and money. Health is a must-have as this game is tough. It's tough because you really do take a lot of hits, and every time you get hit, it takes a lot off your life. Either way, you'll be dying a lot, and that's okay because this is an arcade game and you're meant to die a lot and keep pushing quarters into the cabinet. Throughout each level, if you waste too much time killing enemies or gathering hidden goodies from breakable items, an arrow will come up telling you to get your ass moving. I've got to say that this is the most annoying part of this game. It seems that this stupid arrow comes up way too quickly and you don't have a chance to scavenge for treasure. Did they really think that the player won't figure out that he needs to keep moving? Every level you fight in has a mid-boss and a final boss. Once defeated, the mid-boss will usually drop a sword power up. This is great and helps a lot while it lasts. The problem is that once you take a hit, it's gone and you're back to your basic sword before you know it. Boss battles are tough and I died many times fighting bosses. The combination of pushing up to jump and trying to avoid these bosses makes the game difficult. I really do like the level designs in this game and they all feel like feudal Japan which is what I hope the developers were going for. I also like the explosions after you defeat a boss. The more explosions, the better. I'm surprised it didn't show up on the PC engine since IRM loved porting just about everything there, but alas it didn't. To be honest, this game really didn't win me over. Sure it was fun for a short time, but overall it wasn't enough to keep me interested. What do you think about this one? Finally, we have Bonk's Adventure arcade version from Kaneko. That's right, Bonk got its very own arcade game. As far as I can tell, this one was only ever released in Japan and parts of Asia. Let me know if you know differently. Right away, you get to select from 21 different stages. This one plays a bit differently than the Bonk that each and every one of us without exception know and love. Firstly, you can't keep spinning in the air. Once you press the attack button in the air, you're committed to landing on the ground or an enemy with your head. Also, the power-ups work differently as you become a bunch of different kinds of things now. Like here, he's Skeleton Bonk. Looks cool, but I really don't know what this means. Each enemy takes at least two hits to disperse, and you can't chain attacks like you can in the home releases. The goal is to basically make it to the end of the stage as fast as possible, and the stages are very short as a result. You can collect the smiley faces, but this time they attach to your head, which is pretty weird and looks even more weird. But think of it as making your head bigger. This can be pretty handy for attacks. It can also be used to block some enemy projectiles. But when you get touched, they all fall off and you need to go and collect them again. And of course, since this is a bonk game, there's lots of footballs, basketballs, and soccer balls around. If you like bonk, you like sports, period. I mean, they're like the same damn thing. You carry balls for some extra points, and at the end of the level, you can make a sweet basket, touchdown, or goal. Unfortunately, the game just isn't tremendously great. There's just so much random chaos going on all the time that it's really more of a chore to try to enjoy it. After each third level is complete, you get your choice of one of seven bosses to fight. And as you might guess, I don't really care for the majority of these boss fights. Once again, there's just so much random crap going on that it's really hard to focus on what needs to be done. Each boss needs to be hit 15 times, which sounds a lot easier than it is. They throw a lot of other enemies to attack you, each of which take multiple hits to die. The boss fights just aren't as fun as they should be. 
After the boss is defeated, you play through three more levels of your choosing. Anyway, the graphics are really, really good with multiple layers of scrolling, excellent artwork, and great color. The music is also pretty good, though fairly quiet in comparison to the sound effects. A lot of it has been arranged from the original games. This is definitely the best looking bonk game out there, but also the worst playing and honestly the least enjoyable. It's no wonder that this never came to a home console because we already had better bonk games there. I appreciate what they tried to do to bring some freshness to the formula, but it just didn't really work. I wonder how much different it would have been if it were made by Red or Hudson. I guess we'll never know. And there you go, there's some more games that did not get a home port. And mm -hmm. you know, some of them almost kind of good. We're yeah, I of them. actually, I really liked Trio of the Punch. That yeah. was one that surprised me. I just liked how the flow of the game went. It was really fun. You know, why did you get the good game? Mm -hmm. I, mean, <laughs> I got stuck with Bonk's Adventure and, oh my goodness. Because <laughs> I'm the good guy, that's why. Yeah. Anyway, uh, let us know of some more games that did not get a home console port, if you can think of any. Um, well, I'm, there are a lot of them out there. So, And what are some of your favorite arcade games that did not get ported home? And in the meantime, thank you for watching GameSec. Hey Joe, you know I hate playing MAME games on my computer? Yeah. Well this is the answer. We're going to be playing some arcade PCB games. What game is that? It's Party Time Gone to the Diver 2. I hear it has pretty women in it. Let's play! Okay. Man, I hate Tate games like this. Tate? You mean Tate? Whatever, who cares? <sighs> yeah, I agree. Hey, are you gonna let me have a turn? Why? Because you got the last girl naked. Oh, come on! She's hot. <laughs> I like that. <laughs>